The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. This is Mark Richardson. I'm the president at Fiber Technology here in uh, Scotts Valley, California. And uh, welcome to our uh, one-hour webinar uh, on an introduction to ME Scope. So we have how many signed up right now? So we have six of you from around the world. That's a good audience. Uh, myself and Brian Schwarz, who's our uh, uh, applications engineer here at, uh, at Vibrant, are in our training room. And we're going to spend an hour together on a computer and uh, show you through uh, some of the basic steps of Emmyscope. OK, so we've got a few more coming on board here. Now we're up to 12. So a minute ago, it was only six. And uh, so we're a few more of you are now joining us, which is good. Welcome. Uh, again, this is Mark Richardson speaking. I'm going to lead you through some of the basic steps in the use of Emmyscope. But we'll try to get through uh, as much as possible here in the next hour. We're going to import some data. We're going to build a simple model. We're going to look at uh, animated uh, shapes, uh, what we call ODS, or deflection shapes. And then we're going to do some curve fitting and, and look at the modal parameters, animate the mode shapes. And uh, hopefully, we'll get all that done here in the next hour. So uh, you should be able to see my screen. It's got uh, a uh, recognizable sports car on, on, the, on the screen. And uh, this is not mine, unfortunately. Uh, Maybe someday, but uh, you can tell this is a this is a pretty nice looking uh, Italian sports car. Maybe one of you uh, is fortunate enough to own one. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to double click on Emmyscope over here on the on my desktop, and you can see I've got an Emmyscope here, and then an Emmyscope 64-bit version. I'm going to run the 64-bit version. This is a a little bit newer with our Emmyscope shipments. We now ship it uh, in both varieties so that if you have a 64-bit operating system, uh, you can take advantage of uh, a larger memory and handle larger amounts of data in Emmyscope with the 64-bit version. Now, my version of the software comes up here in what we call the, the sales demo. Uh, opening screen. And here I can pick any one of the, the Emmyscope packages. So you can see that up here I have a VT950 Visual STN package uh, in the pick list. And all the other packages are available here. This is for a salesman to show a prospective customer um, the various uh, options that are available in Emmyscope. And you can see we've got quite a few but if I just leave, leave it on STN, which uh, includes all of the options, you can see they're all checked here. The VES series are the various options that I can purchase with uh, a package and add to a package uh, in ME Scope. Down here at the bottom is our latest uh, software option. I've got it turned off. It's called Mechanicom, and that's for machinery monitoring applications. So we won't get in that today. Uh, we are offering a, another uh, series of webinars, monthly webinars, to explain uh, the use of Emmyscope as part of the Mechanicom software. So let's just go ahead and click OK, and that will enable all of these options in Emmyscope to run. Now, depending on which package you have purchased, and we're going to use at least up through, you can see they're in, in a progression here from ODS to ODS Pro to Modal to Modal Pro, OMA, and so on. We're going to use at least the features up through the visual modal, the VT570. So if you own uh, at least that package or any of these that are further in the list, then you will have all the capabilities in your software that we're going to use today. I'm going to go ahead and click on OK. And now it should open Emmyscope here. And, uh, and we'll go from there. Now, this is what we call a start page. 
my software, uh, my computer is attached to the internet, so over here we get off of the internet uh, a uh, kind of a brief history of the software. Uh, ME Scope is our only product uh, at Vibrant. We're a small software company. We've got 10 employees, and we focus all our energy on uh, the Emmyscope software and the Mechanicom software, our newer package for uh, monitoring. Uh, so that will give you a little bit of history. Normally what we do is when we fix bugs and add features, and if you are on support, on our support system, which now we call Software Maintenance and Support, SMS, um, you will be able to download the latest date code of software. You can see that my version here is uh, September 27th, uh, so it's, uh, what, about a week old, not quite a week old. And uh, over here on the left side are my recent projects. An Emmyscope project will have a file extension with a .vtprj, and then any name that I want to name the file. An Emmyscope file contains all the information for uh, uh, working with data, which we call data block of time or frequency data, and uh, curve fitting the data, getting mode shapes from it, getting ODS from it, building a 3D model so that we can look at these shapes in animation and so forth. So we're going to go through most of that today, but all the information that I would need to look at shapes and animation is contained in an Emmyscope project. I can only have one project open at a time, so I can open up one of these projects, or I can go down here and open a project that I have stored on my, on my computer disk, or I can create a new one. And then down here below, if I'm connected to the internet, I can go to the Vibrant website, I can go to a 3D model store where many of the, the 3D models are more sophisticated. I can download one of those and uh, use it in my project. Or we also have a user form where you can ask questions. So these are things that are available in the start page. I'm going to go here and create a new project. So we're going to start uh, brand new with no information. And the first thing it wants to know is what do you want to name this project and where do you want to save it on the disk? So this is a brand new project. You can see down here it's called New Project 01. I'll just rename it to uh, my first project. And then I'm going to put the dot in there with a VTPRJ. So that's and up here it's showing you where it's going to save the, the project. It's under My Documents. Now this is Brian's computer, so it says B. Schwartz. My Documents, Emmyscope VES. This is where Microsoft recommends that we save data files. So the software is located on the C drive typically, and this is a, a separate folder under My Documents, Emmyscope, and that's where my project's going to be saved. When you install the Emmyscope software, we will set that, that uh, folder up for you. Uh, but you can put your project anywhere you like. OK, now Emmyscope is open. There's, there's nothing showing here. This is what we call the work area, this gray area. Up here, I have a number of tabs. And uh, I can look at various projects. And my first tab here is, uh, and you can see each of these tabs is showing me a folder on the disk. This one here is called Vehicles. And there's a picture of the 3D model that's contained in each of those projects. If I put my mouse down here, it will actually give me the name and uh, a little description of the project. And uh, so I can go along here and do that. Over here under the tab called Project, this is a little bit different flyout panel here. And you can see that a project, here's my first project right here. 
And if I put the mouse on there, it's showing me where that project's located on my disk. That's where I just saved it under uh, Documents, uh, Emiscope VES. And a project can contain different types of data, and these are the different types of data that can be contained in an Emiscope project. So we can have structures, we can have data blocks, multiple ones, and that's time or frequency data that's been acquired from a structure. Shape tables, that can contain ODSs or mode shapes or what we call an engineering data shape, so temperatures, pressures, whatever I'm working on can be in a shape table. An acquisition is a special window that will talk directly to some acquisition hardware. So we can, that's an option to Emiscope. I can have acquisition windows to control the hardware, bring the data directly in Emiscope. Reports is an abbreviated version of Microsoft Word. Uh, again, you can document your project and you can paste photos in there and, and virtually anything you can do with Microsoft Word. And then you can move this from a report file into a Word file and generate a, a fancier report with more formatting and so forth. Programming is a relatively new option to Emiscope. We can now program all the commands in Emiscope to do repetitive processes. Basically, it's a spreadsheet, uh, what we call macro programming, and each line in the spreadsheet is a, uh, an Emiscope command. So I can, I can uh, run a program and have Emiscope do a lot of automatic uh, post-processing of my data. And then added files can be uh, movie files or any other file in Windows that's added to my project. Over here on the right side is basically uh, something that looks like a, uh, a Windows Explorer. Well, let me put this back. You can see as soon as I move off the, the panel, it goes away. So in order to keep that up, I can come over here and hit this little pin, and that will pin it and now it's going to stay open for me. And here is something that basically gives me a view of my disk and you can see all the different uh, folders where I have information stored and then down here under documents, MESCO VES, uh, you can see some red ones there. Those are the ones that have been turned into tabs in MESCO. So everything inside this application notes folder, and here they are, these are all Emiscope projects. Those all are under application notes, and that has been added up here as a tab. So there is a little picture of each of those uh, application note projects. The, if there's no structure, then they, it, it, it will put a picture of just the data block showing some of the data. But these other ones all have a, a, a structure in the project, so what you're looking at is just a picture of the structure. Now, how did that get put up there, and how, how did that turn red? Well, if I right-click with my mouse on that folder, you can see that there's a, a little menu that came up here, and it says Show Folder as Tab. Now, if I execute that again, it just took it away, and you can see it's no longer one of the ta tabs. It's disappeared up here. If I want to put it back, I simply execute that command, show folder as tab, and now it's back, and all of the graphics that's contained in each of those is showing in, on the flyout panel. So that's how I can uh, not only put other projects up on a tab on one of these flyout panels, but I can also transfer data from any of these projects into my current open project, which is called my first project here. So I just need to go and click on one of these data blocks here if I wanted to get that data and put it into my current project. Or I could right click and it, there's an add command. I can rename that, that data file 
or I can delete it from the project right here. So this gives me a way to manage my Emmyscope projects uh, right from within Emmyscope. Okay, I'm going to unpin this so the flyout panel will, uh, I'm going to put the auto hide back up and so it disappears. Now typically the first thing you want to do is get some data, some acquired data into Emmyscope and then we're going to look at that data. Next we're going to build a 3D model so we can look at ODSs from the data. Then we're going to curve fit the data and get mode shapes from it and uh, with modal frequency and damping also. So let's go through these various steps. The first thing I want to do is import the data. Up here is uh, a, com a menu of commands. So virtually all the commands in Emmyscope are in a menu, like one of these. Some of the commands, we'll see when we get into curve fitting, are simply on buttons. So I need to push a button or press a button in order to execute the command. But most of the commands are in menus like this, and each window has a set of commands in, in menus. This is what we call the Emmyscope window here. If I go over here to the File menu, you see I can create some new files. We call these files data files, a, a structure model, data block, shape table, and so on. Or I can import. So I can import a structure model, a data block, a shape table, or I can import one of the older format Emmyscope projects. Uh, we've changed the format here. This was years ago. Uh, so I can still import those old projects and put them into a, uh, a more current version of our project file. And then I can add files. So I can add movies. I can add uh, Word files, uh, Excel spreadsheets, whatever I want to add to this project will uh, then be part of the project. Now the added files we don't actually store into the Emmyscope file itself, whereas these up here are all part of the Emmyscope file. I can zip them up, email them to someone else, they can open them and they will have a complete set of data uh, of these kinds. The added file, I simply have a link to that and it's stored on the disk wherever it happens to be. So let's go here and open up a data block. This, this is what we would typically do in order to get data that was collected with an analyzer or a multi-channel data acquisition system or a, a portable data collector, whatever it is we're using to get Vibration data, Emmyscope is primarily a tool for looking at vibration, although as I've already said, we can import virtually any type of data and look at the distribution of that data in a spatial manner. That's the idea of the, the uh, deflection shape, or let's just say an operating shape. So in this case, we're going to go out here and uh, it's looking at my Emmyscope my documents, Emmyscope VES, and I'm going to go under application notes. Now I want to go down here under tutorials. Now these projects have to do with the tutorial section of the operating manual, and so there's a number of them in here. I'm going to double click. Well, you can see that um, in terms of data blocks, there are none. Why not? Well, down here I have a filter that includes all of the different file formats of data blocks that Emmyscope will recognize and import. So you can see there's a lot of different names in here, different file formats of data acquisition systems and analyzers. And at Vibrant, we're constantly adding to this list because we want to make sure that no matter how you collect your data, you can get it into Emmyscope as a post-processing system. So we have a lot of different file formats. I'm going to go down here and select this one called Universal File Format. Uh, that's a common format that was developed way back in the early 70s by another company that's no longer in this business called the Structural Dynamics Research Corporation. And uh, it's still used by a lot of people in the industry. 
A lot of analyzers will save data in this format, and MEScope can import it. So you can see that it's found one file now. When I select this file extension, it's found one with that file extension, and it's called Plate30FRFs. So I'm going to double click on that, and that will import it. And now the importing command has shown me what it found in the file. And this is a spreadsheet with uh, a lot of the properties of what we call traces or measurements. So each row in this spreadsheet has got a number called an impound number or a measurement number. And then it's describing in each row a type of data that it's going to import from this file. Now, it hasn't done it yet. It's just letting me see what's in there. And I can have time data, frequency data, uh, mode shapes, structures. UFF file format can handle virtually anything that MEScope would be uh, wanting to import. In this case, we're just looking at traces of data. So this is a what we call a data block of data. There's 30 traces in it. Uh, you can see the units here, the measurement type, which is an FRF. We'll talk more about that. But if I click on this, this pick list here, you can see that there are a lot of different types of measurements that MEScope can recognize. Uh, I'm going to do something else here, just in case you're having trouble seeing what's in this spreadsheet. I'll make the window a little larger. Now I'm going to hold down the control key, and I'm going to spin the mouse wheel. So you see what that does? That makes the spreadsheet larger or smaller, depending on which direction I spin the mouse wheel. Now I can see things a little bit better. Now this, you can do this in any spreadsheet in MEScope, and there are quite a few different spreadsheets that, that will contain uh, uh, parameters for various things. So we'll, we'll keep looking at these spreadsheets, and I'll zoom them in a little bit so you can read a little more carefully. Here we're looking at, again, the types of measurements, all sorts of different things in here, time and frequency. Uh, measurements that MEScope will recognize, uh, and then we can do various post-processing based on on uh, what type of data we're we're working with. So these are FRFs that are in this file. They're known as a cross measurement. Uh, so what that means is that uh, they're a cross between two different channels, and typically an FRF will always be between response and force. So you get a clue over here in the units column that the numerator of the FRF is in units of Gs. The denominator is in units of pounds of force. So again, Americans, we don't use the metric system because we don't understand it well enough. It's kind of like a foreign language to us. So a pound of force I have a sense for. Uh, a Newton, I'm not quite sure, but we can convert units. Uh, MEScope will handle any types of uh, uh, units from around the world. In this case, these units are all in Gs per pound, force. That's an FRF, response in the numerator, force in the denominator. That's why we call it a cross measurement, because it was made between two different signals. One being the force that excited the structure, the other being the response caused by that force. The other types of input-output are, are it's strictly an input signal, which would be the force in this case, or it's strictly the output, which would be the Gs of acceleration in this case. So for other things, uh, multiple input, multiple output modeling, we're not going to get into that today. We need to characterize our data as either input, output, both, which means both input and output. That's typically a reference when we have an input and an output, and then a cross measurement like these. Here's some labels. Uh, here's some names of these different things. So we got we got some other information here, and uh, but we're just going to go ahead. This all looks good to me. I'm going to click OK. 
And now it's going to say, what do you want to name this data block? And here I can change the name, but I'll just keep the default name for the disk file. And we'll call it uh, plate30frs. Now it's opening with uh, a look at the data. So this is a typical of, of an Emmyscope window. Some of the other windows are the same way, where I have graphics on the left, and I have a spreadsheet with these properties on the right. Now I'm going to right-click on this window, and you'll see a menu comes up here. Every one of the Emmyscope windows now has a right-click menu in it, and what's contained in there are commonly used commands. You can see the first one here is the one I want to use, center the data block window, and that will make it fill the work area. But let's go back and look at some of these other commands. Here's one called modal parameters, edit, display, format, tools, and so on. Well, if I look up here, I've got the same menus up here, edit, format, tools, transform. Now I've got some other ones up here, one called animate and file, but the commonly used ones are reproduced in this right-click menu, so I can quickly uh, execute commands from these, these menus. Or I can just go up here and execute the same command. So either way, uh, we can execute commands for this window. Okay, uh, all the right-click menus have this center data block or center structure. We'll see how we can use that in any window. And if I, if I execute this again, it goes back small, and then it goes large again. So this is handy for working in a particular window. One of the difficulties is we got limited real estate here, and when we get a lot of windows in Emmyscope, uh, there isn't enough room to see what's in all of them. So we want to go right-click and say center the window so I can work with it, and then when I'm done with it, uh, execute that command again to uh, make the window go back into a, a smaller position. Okay, here we have 30 FRS, and as I scroll through, I'm looking at the log magnitude on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis. So this is a function of frequency. These are FRFs. Remember that I said an FRF is always defined with Gs or some sort of response. It could be inches per second or inches or mils or centimeters. Some sort of response divided by force units. In this case, it's Gs per pound. Very common. We measure vibration with accelerometers. We measure force input with a... Uh, a shaker or an impact hammer that's measuring a load the, with a load cell that's measuring the force. You can see I've got another spreadsheet with the same kind of properties we looked at during the import. This is called a trace spreadsheet or the traces spreadsheet. Each row is called a trace or a measurement. And uh, we're going to come back to that as we go on here. Anyway, I've got some data. Now, in order to look at shapes from this data, I've got 30 measurements. The other clue we can get here is that the DOFs. Now, DOF stands for degree of freedom. And a better way to think of that is motion at a point in a direction. So in this case, we measured motion at points 1 through 30 in a direction of a Z direction, and the reference or the, what we call a reference, or the fixed input or output, in this case is 1z. So let's look at this even more closely. Let me make this even larger, and we'll look at this here. This is a notation that Emmyscope uses. The first degree of freedom, 1z, means that that was we, what we call a roving degree of freedom, because you can see that it's changing. It's going from point 0.1 to 2 to 3. That's a roving degree of freedom. That means we either rove the force around the structure or we rove the accelerometer around the structure. We don't know which one, although 
I'll tell you in this case we wrote the force. Then there's a colon. Then there's a 1z, and the 1z is common to all these measurements. So that, that degree of freedom was fixed. And that corresponds to either putting the force in at the same point and direction through all these measurements, or leaving the accelerometer fixed at one point, at point one in the z, and roving the force around. So in this case, this data could have been taken either way. We don't really care. But uh, in fact, it was taken by uh, fixing the accelerometer at point one in the z and impacting the structure at starting at one in the z, then two in the z, three in the z, and to all 30 points. Now, without looking at the previous model, and it's usually good to build a model of the test article before we take this data, I'm simply going to tell you that this data was taken on a flat aluminum plate with a grid of points, five points in one direction and six in the other. So that would give us a total of 30 measurements. So the next thing we need to do in order to look at the shapes in this data is to build a, a simple 3D model of a plate. So let's do that next. Now I'm going back over here to my project, my first project, and you can see that now I've got a data block in here called uh, BLK with a colon plate 30 FRFs. So we use the uh, the BLK as a as a, an abbreviation for block or data block, and now we're going to go and create a structure uh, in order to look at the shapes that this data has in it. So we want to look at mode shapes, we want to look at deflection shapes from this data. But we need to have a model in order to do that. So now I'm going to go and create a model. So I'll start by saying new structure. So I want to create a structure window or a structure file where I'm going to build the rectangular uh, model. Now it's saying, what do you want to name it? I'm saying structure one is fine. So let's just go with that. And it's going to open up here with an empty window. There it is. Now this window has STR with a colon, structure one, 3D view. STR is, a, is our abbreviation for a structure file. And in this case, we're looking at its window. Now there's nothing in here. Over here is a spreadsheet. There's nothing in there. So how do I get started? Well, I could simply start adding points, or I could add, uh, once I get the points, I could connect them with lines, and we call that a stick model. Then I could connect the points with some triangles, and we call that a surface model. Or if it's a closed surface, then we call it a, uh, a solid model. So those are all term, terms we use. If I come up here onto the toolbar, you can see this is a toolbar with some various commands on it. You can see it's quite different than the one that we had for the data block. Uh, and then we even got some more tools up here. If I put the mouse on any of these tools, I can see where that command is located. For instance, this one here, it says display center the ME scope window. So if I execute that command, it's going to center my window in the on my Windows desktop. But I can execute any of these commands and uh, by just clicking on their, their tool. There's one called Windows, Arrange Windows for Animation. But we're not quite ready to do that yet. Let's go back over here. I wanted to show you this one. This is a list of a whole bunch of what we call objects, drawing objects, and FEA objects. So the first four in the list are points, lines, surface triangles, and surface quads. And then the fifth one is called substructures. So what's that all about? Well, we draw models by starting out by putting some points into the picture. Then we can connect them with lines, and that's what we call a stick model. 
Then we could add some surfaces, and if it's a closed surface, we call that a solid model. We can group all these objects together into what we call a substructure. And so a substructure is just a collection of points, lines, and surfaces. Below are FEA objects that we use. Uh, Emiscope can be used for doing some finite element modeling. So I can take the same geometric model that I use for looking at my experimental data, and I can solve for its uh, FEA mode shapes or its analytical mode shapes and compare those with my test results. That's a more advanced use of ME scope. But you can see that right now we've got it selected. Uh, substructures is selected. This button here is enabled. Uh, let me go and build a plate model with some points, lines, and surfaces. Now rather than just lay some points down and then add some lines and add some surfaces, there's a handier way to do it. I'm going to right click and now you can see the right click menu in this window is different. I've got an edit menu, a display menu, a draw menu. And if I go into the draw menu, see these are the same as, as these ones up here. I've got edit, display, and draw. But down here I want to go into the draw menu because I'm going to draw something. And I want to go down here and execute this command called the drawing assistant. So I'm going to get some help drawing this thing. Now you can see what happened in my window. I've got some axes here so I can kind of get oriented. And over here I have a tab with a list in here of what are called substructures. And then down below here is a spreadsheet with nothing in it, but the first column gives me a clue. It says select substructure. So we're going to build this model as a substructure. Again, a substructure is a collection of points, lines, and surfaces. These first few in here are what we call editable. Editable line, so my model may be just a stick model, literally a stick with some points and lines on it. Or it could be a little more sophisticated. It could be a triangle uh, or a, a plate. That's what we need right there. And you can see as we go down the list, all of these green ones are, uh, again, I'm going to hold down the, the uh, that one does not get larger. Sorry about that. That's not really a, a, a spreadsheet like the other ones. Uh, let me just click in here and see if that, no, that doesn't make it larger. So this is a special type of a spreadsheet here. But you can see the graphics. It's showing me a picture of the substructure, which is going to have lots of points, lines, and surfaces. And then down below here are some other substructures that I have saved in what we call the substructure library. So once I build a model of anything, I can add it to this library, and then I can use it and build new models from the substructure. And you can see there's lots of different little pumps and motors and things in this library. If I double click on any one of them, it'll add it to my picture. Let's go up here and get the one that we want, and it's the editable plate. So we're going to get that one right there, and now it's popped into my graphics area, and you can see that this, this uh, is a plate that's going to have four points. I'm going to go up here and click on this button up here that says display, display objects, points, show the points. So I'll click on that and you can see now there's four points there, and they're in red. Uh, there is a surface there and there's some lines also. You can see I've got the lines displayed. I've got the points displayed. Now I've got some additional tabs over here that allow me to work with this substructure. So I'm going to go to the Dimensions tab. Now let me see if I can make this one larger. Okay, well the units, first of all, are in inches. And I can put in a width, a number of points in the width direction, a height, a number of points there. Okay, the units are inches. Let's say we wanted to have different units for this thing, and we wanted to build it to scale. 
we don't really need to in order to look at shapes. We just need to have the relative dimensions of this model uh, approximately like the test article that we took the data from. That's all we need. We don't really need dimensions for just looking at shapes. But let's just go ahead and, and set up the dimensions uh, the way we like them. Well, in this case, it's inches. I'm going to right click here and under this options box, let me open that. Every window has an options box. And the options box is kind of like your, your dresser drawer in your bedroom. That's where you throw all your junk. And so when you can't find something in an Emmyscope, go to the options box for that window. And it's always in the file menu. So it's under file. In this case, it says structure options. And open that. And there's a number of tabs in here that contain various information. Here's one that, where I can choose my units. So in this case, let's just say, again, I'm using English units. So let's say I, wanted, I measured this thing in feet. Now it says you want to rescale your point coordinates. I'll say, no, I don't care. I'm just changing units here. But you can see my mass units are pounds of mass. And I've got slugs and Gs and kilograms, or no, pounds, I guess. I want pounds of mass. Well, we got G's in there. That that's not really a unit of mass. <laughs> oh, it's grams. I'm sorry, <laughs> I got corrected. Uh, we ought to have it spelled differently then, so we don't make mistakes. Uh, this one is newtons and pounds of force and kilograms of force. And then down here, I've got some length units of meters, centimeters, millimeters feet, inches, and mils. So we've got both the English and the metric in there. I'm going to go ahead and say OK. So you can see that my units now have changed to, to feet. I'm going to make this, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, a grid of uh, points, 30 points, uh, 5 by 6. So I'm going to go here. Let's say it's 1 foot. Oh, let's just make it a little bit bigger. Let's go 2 feet, and uh, we're going to go five in that direction, and we're going to go three feet, and we'll go six in that direction. OK, so there is a flat plate. You can see it automatically changed my substructure to have uh, a grid of 30 by uh, or, uh, five by six points. Now I'm going to change its position. We didn't test it in a vertical direction or in a vertical position. It was in a horizontal position, I can either rotate it or uh, change its origin with respect to this global set of axes. Well, you can see the global axes there. I'm going to rotate it. Every time I hit one of these buttons, it's going to go by 10 degrees. I want to rotate about the global y-axis. So each time I hit one of these buttons, you can see that it's rotating by 10 degrees. So I'm going to rotate it in this direction. I can go either way, or if I'm not happy, I can hit the reset, and it will put it back. Uh, so uh, again, I'm going to just graphically hit that button 10 times, and that rotated it by 90 degrees. Or I can go up here and edit this and put in uh, 45 degrees. And now let me reset. And now I only have to hit it twice to make it rotate properly into the position that I want. So there it is. I'm all done. That's the model I need to animate my data. So I'm going to uh, close this drawing assistant. You can see it's, it's enabled here. And now it's giving me a warning. It's saying, if you're going to leave the drawing assistant, the selected substructure will no longer be an editable substructure. Do you want to continue? Well, that's fine. I'll continue. So now I have a model and a single substructure. And it's got a bunch of properties. We won't go through them all, but here's one that says visible. If I say no, you can, I can make it disappear. So this is another advantage of building your models with a number of substructures. So that when you're looking at a very complicated structure with, a, let's say, a more complex model, you can hide parts of it. And then you can just look at the animation or the motion of part of the structure at a time. That's very useful. 
Now, let's go back. I'm going to arrange for animation. I'm going to execute this command. And you can see that what it did is it, it squeezed the data block in over here. Now, this command will maintain the size of the last window that I touched before I execute that command. So there, it's going to maintain this size. And it made this one larger to fill the space. So here's my data. Here's my model. How do I get this data to animate on this model? Well, I need to create what are called animation equations. And in a nutshell, what an animation equation is, it's a, it's a summation of these various points here, these measurement, pound, measurement and pound numbers, so that the animator knows to go get data for whatever measurement I tell it over here and animate a point over here. Now, I can set up that whole process manually. In other words, create those animation equations one point at a time. Or I can do it in a more automatic way. And the more automatic way is to look at these roving DOFs over here. So my roving DOFs are telling me where this data came from on this model, point one, two, three, four, five, in the Z direction. Now, in this case, Z um, is really a Z direction associated with each point. But this model is set up so that Z should be coinciding with the vertical direction, pointing at the ceiling, so to speak. So I need to tell on the model where point 1 is, point 2, point 3, point 4. That's why it's a good idea to set your model up before you take the data. In this case, I'm going to just take you through, and we're going to number those points. And, uh, and then we'll look at the shapes to see whether we did it correctly or not because we're going to look for certain types of shapes. So here I'm going to go in here under my right-click menu under the submenu called Draw. Here's another submenu called Points. And the first command in there is called Number the Points. So I'm going to open that one up. You can see i got a little dialog box here. And it says Draw Points, Number the Points. That's a command. Click near a point to number it. Next point number is number one. So I want to start, and I'm going to click near a point to number it. There it is. It got numbered as point number one. And then I'm going to just go two, three, four, five. Now, I don't know whether to go back in this direction or start over over here in this direction. But I'm just going to pick a, pick a direction. And I'm going to go through and number all these. And then we'll look at the shapes, and we'll see whether we did this right or not. And then we may have to go back and do this over if we made a mistake. OK, so there they are. I got all 30 of them numbered. Uh, let me say done. I'm done with the numbering. Now, the other thing I want to know is where is 1 in the Z, 2, Z, 3, Z, 4, C? or 4Z. Well, that is on, let me make this large here so we can look at it. And we'll zoom it up here a little bit. That is, on this model, there is a local coordinate axis for each point. And I'm going to go here under Draw. And I'm going to go under another menu called Animation Equations. Remember, the animation equations are where we're going to set up the animation using measurement numbers. I want to go under the equation editor. Now, you probably wouldn't normally go there. But now you can see that on this tab, it, I've got two tabs here. One that says measurement axes. The other that says animation equations. I don't have any equations in this spreadsheet yet because we haven't created them. But what I want to check before I make them is the measurement axes at each of the points. So you can see that what I mean by 1z, 2z, 3z is that at point 1 here, z is pointing normal to the surface, or let's say at the ceiling. So they're all set up the way I want them, the way I took the data. Remember, this data was taken with a roving impact test. So what we did is we put the accelerometer 
it's the reference at point one in the Z and we glued it on or fastened it on there and left it there and then we impacted this aluminum plate uh, at point two in the Z, three in the Z, four in the Z and so forth. So that's what it's showing me here and uh, I can change what I mean by Z at each of these points. I can change it to a different direction if I want but I want it to be the way I actually took the data when I impacted it or when I put accelerometers on and if it was a curvilinear surface then each point is going to have a different definition of what I mean by Z, Z direction. So let's put this back down here and let's go back to our data. Now the other thing that I can do is I can animate data from shape tables, from data blocks, I can have many of them. If I click back over here you can see that here's a, a little pick list and it says animation source. So my animation source is the data block. This is the only one I have. I'm going to animate shapes out of this data block on this model here. Let me turn off the, uh, just so it's not so confusing, I'll turn off the editor. So now we're just back looking at, we're looking at points and um, how do I know that? Well, there's a spreadsheet with the coordinates of all the points. And up here in my pick list, I'm, I'm now looking at points. So in this list, this is telling me what is going to be in the spreadsheet. There's all the lines. Here's all the triangle surfaces, none of them. And here's all of my quad surfaces. So I've got 20 quad surfaces in there. So you can see them all. All right, now I want to start the animation. So let's go back under animation equations and I'm going to create measured equations. And you can see that we create measured equations by assigning impound numbers. That's these numbers right here. We're going to assign each of those based on their DOF to a point and direction on the model. So I'm going to take this first option here. It says match structure and source DOS. Let's go ahead and do that. And it found a match. It said number of measured animation equations is 30. So now I've got animation equations for each of these points. Let's just go ahead and animate the data and see what it looks like. Now this window here has two states. I'm either drawing things, in which case you can see the draw menu is enabled or I'm animating things, animating shapes. And right now I can't animate, but if I go back here under the draw menu, the first command in there is draw, the second one is animate shapes. That's what I want to do. Okay, so there is the animated shape. Well, does that look like anything I would recognize? No, not really. The best thing to do with your data is to go all the way down by DC, and in this case, this model or this this flat plate was tested on some foam rubber or it could be bungee cords. So what I'm looking for down here is a free free what we call rigid body motion of this plate. That doesn't look like any rigid body motion. Let's go and put it on one of the peaks here and that doesn't look very good either. That's a more complicated shape. What I'm looking for at these low frequencies is what I would call first bending or force torsion. Now we use those names uh, because they're the first one we encountered as we increase in frequency, but the shape should also be something very familiar to me, uh, either first bending or first torsion being a very simple waveform for a structure like this or a twisting motion, a very simple twist. I don't see either one of that, those type of shapes here, so I must have done the numbering. Well, there is a, there's a bending mode. That's what I call first bending. So we're in good shape on that. Boy, we're running out of time here. We're probably going to go over a little bit today, so stay with me. If you got another meeting to go to at, uh, at 11 o'clock, it's 11 o'clock here in California, your time is different. But here's the clue that we, we see first bending. 
So what is this shape down here? Well, it kind of looks like a torsion mode, but we numbered the points in the wrong direction. So I'm going to stop this animation, go back to the drawing state of the window, and I'm going to go and renumber the points, number the points. Now I can either start over by pushing the clear all button, which would remove all the labels, or I could simply renumber some of the points. Now in this case, maybe I can't remember the easiest way is I got this sequence wrong here. I went from one to five and then I started here at six. I think just based on that shape that six should have been over here and we'll number in that direction. So you can see how important it is to build your model and number your points before you take the data because you may not remember how you took the data later on and you're going to get it wrong and your shapes are not going to look right to you. So let's go back and clear them all and it says clear all the labels do you want to continue and I'll say yes. And now rather than start at 31 I want to put a 1 in here because I want to start back at point 1. So I'm putting a one in and I'll hit the enter key. And now I'm going to start clicking on points again. Because I saw that first bending mode in there and that, that was a good clue that I, I'm probably doing things right. And let's just see if we can get that, that lower frequency mode, which looks like it's a torsional mode, to animate correctly on this model. Okay, so now I've got them all numbered in a different sequence. I'm done. I've got to reassign. Now I can, I can assign measurements from this source over here too. And it's under the, uh, oh, it's under the animate menu, which is not in my, my pick list here, but I can go up here and it says create animation equations, assign the measurements. So I can do it here also. Okay, it's saying you're going to delete your current equations and all the points are selected. Do you want to do that? And I'm going to say yes. So now let's go back and start the animation. Now that, you see where the cursor's sitting there? That's just an ODS. That's what we call an ODS or a deflection shape. That's how that structure will deform at that frequency, wherever that cursor is. But now let me go down here very low frequency. Now there's what I was looking for. That is the rigid body motion of that structure simply bouncing on the soft suspension that I tested it on. That's what I'm looking for in this data. Now when I go up here to the first peak and put the cursor on that peak, I see a shape that I recognize as first torsion. That's a torsional mode. So you want to find first torsion, first bending when you're in a free-free condition like this. And even if it was a cantilever or it was attached to a stiff boundary, you still see these simple waveforms that you could say that's a, that's a first torsion, that's a first bending mode. As I go up here in frequency, there is a bending mode, but it's in a stiff direction. So we got everything right this time. We numbered the points correctly and we'd expect the structure to deform with a bending mode, but in a stiff direction where, uh, as opposed to down here in the longer dimension, we've got a bending mode which is a less stiff direction of the structure. Now, I'm, see, I'm not quite on the peak. I'm going to spin the mouse button here a little bit and uh, there we are. And I'm using, I zoomed in over here on my data. Let me move this, we call this a, a splitter bar. I can either look at properties or I can look at graphics. And I need to put this, this is just a line cursor. Now a better way to look at these shapes is uh, to use what we call a, a peak cursor. So that's over here. Display the peak cursor. Let me see if I have it in here. I also have it right here. So I can go down here under cursor, peak cursor. Now what it's going to display is the value at the peak 
that it finds in each of these 30 measurements. Now even a better way to look at my data is to, there's the bending, is to display the imaginary peaks. So let me do that. I'm going to go over here and say display the imaginary peaks. Now that's what I'm looking at is that data. If it's acceleration data or displacement, uh, if I put the peak cursor there, it will display the peaks. Uh, and you can see I'm scrolling through my measurements now. I'm actually looking at the peak of the imaginary in each of these measurements. So very clean data. If you take data like this, MESCOPE is always going to give you some very nice results. Your data is probably not going to look like this, however. It's going to be noisy. It's going to have uh, maybe some distortion in it, nonlinear, what we call nonlinear behavior, uh, lots of noise, maybe some peaks in there from uh, 60 cycles or 50 cycles or some garbage, but here you can go in and look for uh, first bending and first torsion. You should always see something like that. And as you go up in frequency, the waveforms get more complicated. That's what we expect to see for a resonance. Okay, let's do some quick curve fitting here. I'll show you a couple of curve fitters, and then we're going to uh, adjourn this meeting for today. Um, how do we do curve fitting? Let me go back here and center this window. Now you can see I'm still looking at the imaginary. Let me show you one more thing before we go to curve fitting, and that is to overlay all those imaginary peaks. That way I can really see where the resonances are, where the modes are. So I'm going to overlay all 30 measurements. Now you can see that the picture's changed a little. The animation hasn't changed because I'm just displaying out of those 30 measurements the peak values of the imaginary part. Those are the, the narrowest peaks and they're, and if I just click here it'll put the cursor over there and I can look at that. So that ODS is being dominated. The ODS at that frequency is being dominated by resonance and uh, so its shape is being dominated by the mode shape of that resonance. So mode shape is different than an ODS. In this case, we're looking at the ODS, and it looks like a mode shape because that resonance is dominating the ODS at that frequency. That won't always be the case with your data. If the structure is more heavily damped, if you have two modes that are very close together in frequency, two resonances close together in frequency, then looking at it through this type of animation, you're going to see an ODS which doesn't look like uh, a mode shape. It's going to be dominated by two or more mode shapes. But to get started, when you've got nice clean data like this, see here's two resonances that are fairly close together, but the shape is still being dominated by that resonance. When I move over here, it's a totally different looking shape and again, the ODS is being dominated by a different resonance or a different mode shape. Okay, so let's go do some quick curve fitting here. I'm going to go here under a right click, and the first, the second command is called modal parameters. So I want to turn that on, and now you can see that the window has changed quite a bit. Let me. Uh, do some things here to get all of our data back so we can look at it a little better. I'm going to turn off the overlay. I'm going to go back to the log magnitude and I'm going to turn off the peak cursor. So let's just take a look here and here's our 30 measurements on the top. Below we have something called a mode indicator. What is that? Well, we'll see here in a minute what that is. That's just going to go through all of my 30 measurements and draw up a, a peaks function, which will show us where the resonance peaks are. And then over here on the right, we've got uh, a bunch of tabs, one called mode indicator, another called frequency and damping, another called stability, and finally one called residues and save shapes. 
So curve fitting in Emmyscope is actually done in two curve fitting steps. One to get the frequency and damping. And then stability is a different way to do it. And then finally the residues, the second curve fitting step, which gives us the mode shape components. Residues are components of each mode shape. So frequency and damping we typically will get one value for each mode by curve fitting all of the measurements. Residues we get one value for each mode and each measurement or each FRF. Now in order to use this tab here you can see that it's it's got a number, it's got a box down here called mode and there's one mode in there. So it's only going to curve fit for one mode. So all curve fitters have to be told the size of the curve fitting model or the number of modes that you're looking for the data for when you do the curve fitting. So one of the ways to set this up is to use the mode indicator and count the peaks on the indicator. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Now here this mode indicator, it's called a CMIF, we won't get into that right now. It's going to use the imaginary part of the data. Remember, we animated the imaginary part. And those are the nice sharp peaks that we want to use. So there it is showing the imaginary part of the data. It's basically all summed together. And there's five red dots on those peaks. And you can see that it's, it's counted five peaks. So the software has counted five modes or resonance peaks. Here I have a little separator here and this is for separating the noise from the, the noise peaks from the resonance peaks. If I shove this way up you can see that now it's down to one. It won't go less than one but it's really only counted one peak. As I pull this down it's going to count more and more peaks and then if I pull it way down I can even count six peaks. The, the one way down here at, at DC is that, that rigid body motion that, that we may not be interested in. So let me push it up here. That's what we call the noise threshold line. And that's going to separate the resonances from the, from the noise. Your data is probably going to have lots of noise in it. You can see there's a little bit of noise in this data, but not very much. It was taken under ideal conditions, very clean data. So now I'm going to go here to the second tab. And I'm going to estimate using something called a global polynomial method, the frequency and damping. So I'll push the button there. Now it's giving me a little summary. It's going to, going to look for the, the, uh, the frequency and damping of five modes. And it's giving me some other information here. Let me just go ahead and say yes. So now I have some data in this spreadsheet. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. I've got the frequencies. I've got the damping in hertz. The damping in percent, two different ways to look at damping. This is called the percent of critical damping, which involves the frequency. This is called the half power point damping, or the 3 dB point damping, or the damping decay constant. A lot of different names for this version of the damping, but it's basically the width of the resonance peak. So you can see that if, in here now, if I zoom in around one of these peaks, I'm going to put my cursor right there and spin the mouse wheel. There's actually a line here. The vertical part is the frequency of that particular uh, mode. So we're looking here. See when it turned red and I selected it, that line is at 423 point blah, blah, blah hertz. And the width of that line is the damping in hertz. So these are the units along the axis here is hertz. The width of that line is the damping actually twice that. So four hertz, about four hertz. Let me check that. I'll put the band cursor up here and we'll, we'll see that, okay, well there's two samples of data. Uh, the width, the values between those, those, let me put the cursor values on here and you can see what they are. So there they are, 420 and 424. So the width of that cursor band is 4 hertz. That's what the curve fitter told us was the amount of damping there for that particular mode. So let me turn this back off. And let me zoom out. So we've got frequency and damping for these modes. 
Now we're just going to go right to the residues and we're going to say give us the residues for these modes. You can see I don't have any residues over here. Residue magnitude and phase is not there. Uh, now I've got it and now it's drawn a red line. Once it has all the modal parameters, it will draw a red line on top of my experimental data and that's an ideal expression of the FRF given these modal parameters here. So that was built by the software and you can see the magnitude. I can also look at something called the Bode plot which is the magnitude and phase. Now you can see on this data the magnitude and phase of the red line versus the experimental data a pretty good match. Now that's necessary but it's not sufficient. What's important are these mode shape or these modal parameters over here. That's what we're trying to get is some good modal parameters. If we have good ones, then the red line will lay on the data. But if I told it there were 10 or 20 modes in this data and there's really only five, the red line may lay on the data, but the modal parameters are not going to be any good. Well, how do I know that? Well, I want to go back. I want to save this data. So here's a button called Save Shape. I'll save that data and I'm going to put this data into a shape table. I'll have to create a new one because I don't have one in this project. And now I've got a shape table. Let me go ahead and make this large so we can see what's in here. Here's my frequency and my damping up above in a spreadsheet. Again, I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see it. And then down below are my shapes. And these are called residue mode shapes because we simply save the residue from each of our 30 measurements. You can see the DOFs here. They're the same as the 30 measurements. The measurement numbers are 1 through 30. So we can animate this data with the animation equations that we already set up for the FRFs. And over here is the magnitude and phase of my five modes. So let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to push... Well, I can push this button to make it smaller. I can also push this up here to arrange for animation. Now I've got my data block up here. It's still in the curve fitting uh, state. Let me take it out of that. I'll just put it back here so I'm just looking at the data. You can see the what we call the fit function is still overlaid on my data. That's OK. Down below here, I've got my shape data. Now if I look. I click here and I look into the pick list. I've got my FRS and my shape table as or none as possible animation sources. So if I just go here to the shape table and select that as my animation source, then I start the animation. There it is. There's my first mode shape at 339 hertz. There's my second one. Here's my third one, my fourth one, and my fifth one. So I think we're going to stop with that. We've gone through some curve fitting. We've built the model. We've looked at ODSs. We've looked at mode shapes. Uh, next month, maybe we'll, depending on how many sign-ups, uh, we may do beginners, but I want to move on and start showing more of the advanced. There's a lot more advanced curve fitting we should get into. So maybe next month. So stay tuned, and we'll send out an email and invite you to uh, our next uh, webinar. Have a good day. We're going to sign off.